Okay. All right, there's a little bit of uh, formality we have to go through first. Uh, this event is going to be recorded. Uh, so if you do choose to speak one of your questions, obviously that will go into the recording. If you don't want people to hear your voice, um, by all means type it into the chat window. Um, my colleagues, uh, uh, Katrina will be looking at the chat window and we will get to the chat the questions at the end of the session. Uh, after I've given my talk, I'm going to be joined by uh, Dr. Chitra Balakrishna, who is uh, head of the cybersecurity team in the School of Computing, and she'll be giving her viewpoint on contact tracing. And also I'll be joined by Ray Corrigan, who is a um, staff tutor in the school who also has a great interest in okay i'm going to take control of my slides <laughs> and um uh, sorry go back ray is a staff tutor in the school and has great interest in all the issues of uh, privacy and security uh, so this is an unusual way of giving a presentation i'm basically talking to a dead screen i have no idea who's still here or anything like that. So bear with me, this may not be um, technically very proficient. The content is great. If you want it the other way around, um, I believe our talk radio is still in business. Okay, so this is an overview of contact tracing apps. Uh, they're in the news at the moment because of the current pandemic. I'm gonna try and cover a lot of things. I'm not gonna go into great detail about how the technology works if people are interested. Again, ask questions afterwards and I can point you to the technical documentation that's been uh, released by the government and other bodies. So let's get started with what is contact tracing? And it's a simple thing. It's who's been close to someone who's carrying an infectious disease. And it's uh, a well-established technique and it helps direct aid to people who have potentially been infected by a disease. And it also allows us to study how an outbreak that spread. So you may have heard of the concept of patient zero, the first person to contract an illness. And contact tracing is a way of tracking people who've been in contact with one another to try and find out where an illness originated and how it then spread through a population. And although uh, we've started hearing about it a lot in the last couple of weeks, it isn't new. It probably originated during the flu pandemic of 1918-1919, which we're, again we're all hearing about which was one of the world's first great global pandemics. It's been used repeatedly uh, in West Africa and Central Africa to try and identify the spread and the cause of Ebola, a highly infectious and often fatal disease. And it's also been widely used in cholera uh, outbreaks in Bangladesh, which is, a, again, a very infectious disease spread through sewage and it spreads very rapidly through populations. And again, it's there used to find out where the original outbreak comes from and almost always is due to uh, sewage getting into drinking water. Uh, this is usually been done by getting teams of relatively inexperienced people to go out amongst the population, knock door to door and ask questions, fill in questionnaires and then compile the data. Uh, what's different here is this is the first major disease outbreak where mobile technology has allowed some of the some of the tracking to be automated. And uh, we're looking at two basically fundamental technologies here. Um, the first one is generically called location tracking. And that is where is someone at a particular time and place. And it gives you a precise location, it gives you a precise time. And from there you can work out who's been close to another, who's been close to who at a particular time. And the again, there are Technologies, again, which you will be familiar with, uh, most common are GPS, using satellite constellations, or mobile phone base stations. Um, your mobile phone not only talks to one base station, but it gets signals from others. You can work out from the strength of the signal roughly where you are relative to known fixed base station locations. Um, GPS is the one that gets all the attention. However, if you've ever used GPS and forgotten to take your charger cable into the car with you, you quickly realize it draws the battery down very, very quickly. So it isn't good for long duration tracking. And uh, it also doesn't work in a lot of places. Uh, it, it's great in the open countryside. It's not so great if you live in a valley or you're downtown surrounded by skyscrapers or there are a lot of trees around. 
Uh, it has been used, um, GPS has been used uh, in uh, Israel for their current COVID tracking application, though uh, the Israeli authorities have admitted it isn't terribly precise because people are in urban areas, they're going in and out, and they're not getting a very good signal. And all location tracking, whether you're using GPS or mobile phone base stations, has privacy implications because you know where you are at a particular time. And obviously some governments and other organizations think that's a great thing to know. The alternative is Bluetooth, uh, which the good news is, it's confined to very short distances. It's not a particularly powerful signal. So five to 10 meters is pretty much the limit of a Bluetooth transmission. It doesn't use much power. Uh, if you've got a mobile phone with Bluetooth in it, it doesn't draw your battery down very much to use it all day, whether you're using it for headphones or keyboards or things like that. Uh, it's so cheap to put Bluetooth into a device that pretty much every mobile phone now comes with Bluetooth. Uh, the drawback uh, in some regards for contact tracing is Bluetooth on its own can't give you a location. You have to combine it with a location tracking technology if you want to know where people are when they're using Bluetooth. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about is a Bluetooth solution for contact tracing, but some of the concerns I'm going to raise later apply to each and every one of these uh, tracking technologies. Okay, uh, before we go any further, I should probably point out that Bluetooth isn't perfect. Um, it is very short range, as I said. Um, five to 10 meters is pretty much the limit of a good Bluetooth signal. However, um, if you live in an apartment block, that means a Bluetooth signal can leak through an apartment wall. Now, this is important because if we're in a world where some people are infected, the person next to you may be infected using a contact tracing app, but your, your phone will pick up their signal. Uh, it, can easily go past the two meter safe distancing rule uh, that we're all being told to use when we're in the supermarkets or lining up for a train or something like that. So again, it can spread, but it's, the range of Bluetooth is much greater than the safe distancing. And that means it could cover a good part of a bus or a railway carriage. And that means if someone's using contact tracing apps that use Bluetooth, you could be completely safe obeying all the rules and being notified you're in danger. And that means there will be more infections than there are in reality, there appear to be more infections than there are in reality, which we call a false positive. Generally, the app would be reporting more cases of infection than are actually existing. So let's, let's look generically at how contact tracing would work with the Bluetooth solution. Uh, I'm going to introduce Alice. Uh, if you ever do cybersecurity in any shape or form, you'll meet Alice and her friends. Now, Alice is just a um, so someone out there who's been sufficiently concerned that, about uh, an outbreak that she's gone and installed an app onto her mobile phone. And when she installs the app, she downloads it from an app store, and she gets what's called an installation ID. And that's a unique code that's given to Alice in uh, the app store, which identifies Alice and the app as having a relationship with one another. Her app then generates a pseudonym for Alice, and she is combined is done by combining the installation ID with some information about Alice. Uh, the UK government has said this will be the first part of your postcode. So, if you lived at the Open University, you would your in, your pseudonym would include MK7, for instance. Some other apps around the world ask for much much more information, uh, depending on how totalitarian your government is, it might be your phone number, it may be your email address, your address, and things like that. And as Alice uses the app every day, her phone is going to use her installation ID to generate a new pseudonym. And this pseudonym is going to be broadcast to other users of the app as she walks around. Um, if you read the literature, some people call this pseudonym a blob. Um, I have no idea why it's called a blob, but you may see that. Uh, I'm going to use I'm going to use the word pseudonym because the word blob is not very nice. Let's see how Alice would go. Alice is walking around, and one day she bumps into Bob. She 
gets within, say, two metres of Bob. Bob has also installed the app. He has an installation ID and a pseudonym. And when Alice is close to Bob, her, the two phones are going to share some information. Alice's phone will broadcast her pseudonym to Bob, and Bob's phone will broadcast his pseudonym to Alice. And the, each of their apps will then store the other person's pseudonym inside, their, inside the app application, along with a timestamp when they actually met one another. At this point, information is completely private between the two of them. No information has been sent beyond the phones. The NHS or whatever organisation that is running the app is, knows nothing about Alice meeting Bob. All the data is encrypted on the phone, so even if the phone is stolen, no one can actually get in and easily find out what the relationship, uh, what the relationship is between Alice and Bob and their contacts. And this goes on as Alice walks around day to day. She meets Charles, the two phones talk to one another, and they exchange pseudonyms. And all the time, their phones are building up long contact lists containing pseudonyms of times and dates when people met one another. And we'll have one more person, uh, Alice meets Daphne, and Daphne's also got the app, and the two phones, again, share information. So far, Nothing's happened as far as Alice is just going away, just going around her all everyday life. What we want to do now is try and do some contact tra uh, tracking on them. And this is done in two ways. And they go by the phrase centralized and decentralized. And this term basically refers to where the risk assessment is done rather than where data is stored. In a centralized model, a central computer assesses risk that one person has transferred an infection to another. In a decentralized model, the risk assessment is done on individual devices. And now, the decentralized model is the one that's getting a lot of attention at the moment. And the reason for this is because um, Apple and Google, the two biggest providers of mobile phone operating systems, have jointly come up with a model for producing decentralized uh, risk assessment. And this is in conflict with uh, several governments around the world, most notably the UK's government, who would prefer a centralized model. I'm going to very quickly go through the uh, what each of these models do. So, Let's look at centralised contact tracing to start with. And as I said, this is what the UK government is currently proposing. This may not be what actually gets deployed. It's being trialled in the Isle of Wight at the moment, and the, the app is variously called Colocate or Solar. However, this may not be the app we all used. The Prototype app was developed uh, for NHS X, which is the um, technology arm of the NHS, and it was developed by a company called VMware Pivotal Labs, and the underlying algorithm was developed by Oxford University. So, in a centralised contact tracing application, Alice has been walking around, meeting people, and her phone has been storing data about their pseudonyms for some time now. Alice, unfortunately, starts to feel a little bit ill. Under the current proposal, Alice does not have to go to a doctor or do a telephone call. She basically says, I'm not feeling very well, and then starts feeding her symptoms into the app. This is basically self-assessment. When she developed, so Alice can choose to self-report her symptoms. The app will give her advice. It will say, oh, it sounds a bit you've got the illness. You need to take the following steps and you should probably self-isolate. And then Alice can choose to upload her contact list to the NHS. So all of the, the pseudonyms of people she has met in the last 28 days are uploaded to a central NHS server. There is no check that Alice is actually infected. She has decided that she, she meets certain criteria. There's no further checks on this point. 
Now, Alice's data is sent to a central NHS server, or rather a server farm, which receives her data. All the pseudonyms go into the central server, and the server processes the data. It discards contacts that are not at risk. So perhaps the signal that came from Bob's phone uh, earlier on was very weak, which implies that he was quite a long distance away. Or more than two weeks have passed. So the server will decide that Bob is not a serious risk and discard his contact from the list. The remaining contacts the server will decide are actually at risk of uh, Alice having spread the disease. So what happens then is the server pushes the alerts to the remainder of Alice's contacts. And that means it broadcasts individual messages to each of those contacts at the same time. So Charles and Daphne are going about their everyday life. They suddenly will get a message from their app that they have been in contact with someone who has been diagnosed or self-diagnosed with COVID-like symptoms. They don't know who that person is. All they hear is they've been in contact with someone. They will then be given advice on what they need to do. And again, it will be something like, go into self-isolation, arrange to be tested. So the key points of a centralized approach are, Alice's privacy is protected. Uh, no one needs to know that Alice has been infected or Alice feels that she's been infected. Only her pseudonym is shared and the pseudonym is gobbledygook to humans. It's, it will be a lot of work for, uh, for someone to actually work out which pseudonym applies to which person. Uh, the good news is the privacy of Alice's contact is partially protected. Again, only pseudonyms are shared and there's no direct link between Alice and her contacts. So neither Alice nor her contacts can, say, can point fingers at one another and say, you're the one who infected me. Um, the centralized approach is really good for doing epidemiology. Because the NHS gets all of the data with all of the timestamps, it can see where and when people are infected and identify potential hotspots of infection, you know, either communities where there's greater um, uh, transmission going on between people or particular times perhaps associated with transport networks or events going on where people are being infected. However, um, there are some minor risks here, um, the most serious of which is the privacy one. People about who are uninfected are being uploaded to the server. So if, uh, if one of these contacts, if Alice isn't um, uh, infectious, uh, but she uploads her data, people who aren't infected, aren't any risk, are being uploaded to the server. So there's data stored on people that actually perhaps shouldn't be stored. And because the server does contain a lot of information about people, uh, even though they're pseudonyms, it's potentially valuable if that data could be combined with other information uh, in the future. It could be used to de-anonymize people. It may or may not be a serious risk, and it will be an issue for the people who actually do the uh, physical and um, protection of the servers to also take into consideration. These are potentially high-value contacts. So the alternative is decentralized contact tracing. And again, this is where you're going to be hearing an awful lot about Apple and Google. Um, they aren't the only uh, show in town. There is also um, a open source uh, system um, that's been developed that does exactly much the same thing in a slightly different manner. Now, in a decentralized system, just to reiterate, uh, Alice's phone is Alice's phone and all the other people's phones are going to be doing most of the heavy lifting. There isn't going to be central decision making. So as before, Alice has been walking around. Um, she has been building up her contact list. And unfortunately, she starts to feel ill. Again, she is going to self-report her symptoms. The app is going to give her advice on what she should do next, arrange for a test and go into self-isolation in an ideal world. The difference here is that when Alice chooses to share data with the wider world, the only thing that is uploaded is a timestamp of her pseudonym. 
her contact list, the people she has been in contact with, does not leave her phone. And again, there is a central server. However, all the server is doing is storing data, the pseudonyms from people who report symptoms. So Alice is up there, as are several other people. The server actually doesn't process the data. It just holds it, and it doesn't push the data out to users immediately. The data sits there, and it sits there until other users, in this case Charles, their app checks for an update. And it will be doing that every hour, several hours, or perhaps daily. And when it gets an update, it receives a list of new reports of infections, and it gets a whole list of pseudonyms. The pseudonyms are checked against those that are actually already stored in Charles's contact list. So in this case, Charles has met Alice, so the list of the possible infections he's received from the server matches someone inside Charles's contact list. His phone and the app will now assess his risk of infection by comparing the signal strength of the Bluetooth connection and the date and time when he, uh, the uh, contact was made. And if he's at risk, Charles gets guidance. Again, get tested, self-isolate, see you on the other side. Now, the good point, the key points for decentralized post uh, approach key is once again, Alice's privacy is protected because only her pseudonym is shared. Where it scores more highly over the centralized model is that privacy of Alice's contacts is also uh, protected. Uh, there's no link between Alice and her contacts. Once again, there can be any blaming of someone. And Ali Alice's contacts are not shared with the central server. Uh, data is only served on that, uh, shared on that, put on that server when someone tests positive. So someone who doesn't develop any symptoms, their data is never uploaded onto the central server. Uh, however, and there are some howevers on this, uh, the health service doesn't have that precise information about who has been in contact with who, where people are gathering, and things like that at particular times. So there's much less information than to do with epidemiological studies. There's a potential risk that because the data isn't pushed from the server as it arrives to end users, there's a delay between the data being put on the server and end users pulling it down to their phones. And though the data is not particularly valuable because it's much less of it and it's all pseudonyms, uh, the server is a potential hacking target for someone who might choose just to cause grief and to bring the system down. Uh, we can never underestimate the people who just want to make the world burn, as the expression goes. Now, Decentralization has some technical advantages, um, and they all basically rely on the way mobile phones work. And again, this is why you're going to hear an awful lot of discussion about possibly change the UK changing from a centralized model to a decentralized model. Uh, the operating system of your phone, um, it can restrict the functionality of applications, and this is particularly strong in Apple's iOS, running, which runs uh, iPhones. Um, iOS forbids applications from using Bluetooth if they sit in the background. So if you're running the COVID tracking app, uh, but you're also, say, browsing Facebook, your Bluetooth connection for the app will eventually drop. The operating system doesn't allow you to do this. And the reason it's twofold, partly improves security of the phone, but it also reduces the battery drain. So your phone lasts longer. Now, the only way really around this is either to keep the app in the foreground, which is what the authorities made people do in Singapore, which kind of reduces the functionality of your phone, or the user has to keep refreshing it. So you've been you've on Facebook a little bit, and then you go to the app, you check the app, you go back to Facebook, and which is annoying. Um, and what that means is people sooner or later will stop doing the constant switching. So there's a way around it, and it's a really bizarre one. If you have an iPhone running this uh, a centralized app, 
which will be shut down by the phone's operating system, it will go to sleep unless there's an Android phone nearby. And what happens is the Android phone, which doesn't quite have the same restriction, will give your iPhone a little kick every now and then and make the Bluetooth um, come, come back to life very briefly. So what you might need to do if you have an iPhone and a centralized app, you might also want to carry an Android phone and run in the contact app at the same time just to ensure your phone is working all the time. So the way around this is that decentralization, I haven't been updating my slides, so there you go. Uh, there we go. Uh, so let me go point out though, if your, if your app isn't working um, when you're um, in contact with someone who's potentially infected, that contact is never registered. And so you end up with fewer cases of infection than there are in reality. And that's known as a false negative as opposed to the false positive we saw earlier. Um, now, Apple and Google have developed a way around this. So they're going to patch their operating systems and they've released software development tools that allow apps to remain in the background and use Bluetooth on a very sparing basis. However, Apple and Google have said they will only allow applications into their app stores that use a decentralized model. You cannot have a centralized model of contact tracing and use Google and Apple's new software tools. So Apple and Google are actually calling the shots on how governments can track diseases. And that's kind of a key issue for what's coming along. Now, the one thing about all of these contact tracing apps is they need a very high uptake of the population to be useful. Uh, the first app that went into production was called um, Trace Together. Uh, and it ran it's in Singapore, it's a centralized app, as I mentioned earlier. And even though Singapore is one of the richest societies in the world with very high smartphone penetration, and it's also an extremely authoritarian government, which actually doesn't mind telling people you will do something, only 20% of smartphone users in Singapore actually downloaded Trace Together. Uh, whilst there was a study uh, a few weeks ago from Oxford University that suggests something like 60% of all smartphone users are needed for any app to be useful. Uh, and that's hard because there's a whole load of things we need to think about. Uh, the simple one is some people don't have access to a smartphone. If you're over older than 54, uh, the latest data in the UK is only 55% of people over the age of 54 have a smartphone. And once you go over 70, it goes down into like 20% of people. So elderly people don't have access to smartphones. It's a general rule of thumb. Children shouldn't have access to smartphones. Um, those of you with children may disagree. Poorer people don't have access to smartphones. And you need certain level of functionality in your phone. Uh, phones without Bluetooth, for instance, aren't supported. But likewise, anyone who is running an older smartphone with Android, I think before version 8, uh, is not going to be supported by any of the proposed COVID tracking apps. And version 8 accounts for something like 19% of all Android phones in the UK. Um, People struggle to use applications correctly. You should have seen the fun and games I had um, with Ben trying to talk me through using Microsoft Teams for the first time this morning. Uh, and even if we design apps well, uh, people do make mistakes. And if the app tells people like, yep, I think you've been infected, you need to self-isolate, people may not choose to do so, and they may also not choose to share their data. So. People don't do what they're told, even if it's in their own self-interests. Uh, there is a potential for abuse of the system. As I said earlier, all of the proposed apps rely on people self-reporting symptoms. So it is not beyond the possibility of someone choosing to report uh, they feel bad and uploading their data, even though they're in perfect health. And Finally, there's some people, it's hard to believe that anyone would not trust an application, uh, but there, is, there are people who will tr not trust an application because 
it comes from the government, for instance. And there are people who might say, hold on, this is a health, this is a, a security nightmare. I should never have it on my phone. Um, I might fall into one of those categories. You don't have to decide which. Now, there's some things we should think about before the UK actually rolls out its application. Uh, as I said, it's being trialled in the Isle of Wight now. Uh, in the next week or two, the government is proposing to uh, release it nationwide. And when the hard sell comes in and when you start hearing about it, there are some questions you should keep in your mind. And um, these are just some of the ones that came to me. OK, could you be penalised for not using the application? Um, will I be required to show that I've got the app on my phone if I use a tube train, if I get on the bus, if I come back to work before I fly? And as we just saw, some people either can't or won't be able to use the application. So we're at a risk of technology dividing people. And that's something we should always try to avoid. It's Unfortunately, we live in a world where a technological solution is always seen to be better than a non-technological solution. So think about that one. Uh, this is a little bit more geeky, I understand. Uh, will the program itself be open to scrutiny by people who are security professionals? Uh, what is this code actually doing? Uh, is it safe? Is it well programmed? Does it you know, perhaps ask for more information than um, it tells me? Is it stealing information? Is it broadcasting uh, when it says it shouldn't be? Now, that's called open, and the way I get around that is called open source software. And what it is, is the program itself is open to scrutiny. Now, the good news is that the beta code, which is the pre-release code for the NHS app, has been released on the GitHub um, repository, which is a big software repository online, and people are currently going through it. And so far, they haven't found too much wrong with it. Um, it's not perfect, but bearing in mind it's been knocked together very quickly, it's not appalling. Uh, the next thing we should think about is, will this application ever be shut down? Um, Hopefully, this pandemic will come to an end, but will the government say, actually, this is a really useful tool and there might be further outbreaks in the future or a different disease, this is something we should keep going? And is it possible they'll go, well, we're not actually getting enough epidemiological data, so we'd like to get more information from you. We'd like to know where you are at any particular time. So location data also gets uploaded. And that's um, something that various people have suggested. And um, normally, I'd say to someone, if you want to stay safe online, make sure your computer automatically up, uh, updates itself. But with something like this, can the functionality of this program be increased in the background without you realizing it and uh, without you ever being aware of what's going on? So, yeah, that's something we should possibly worry about. Other thing is, we're giving huge amounts of data to the NHS. And um, so who actually has access to that data? Is it stored and how is it stored? And what will the data be used for? Uh, unfortunately, the NHS, and um, this is something I'm sure Ray will be able to talk to him about much later, is um, doesn't have a great history of actually respecting people's uh, data when it's uploaded. The NHS has sold and given personal medical data to other organisations without permission in the past. And the big one here is, can you ever say, actually, I don't want the government to have this data anymore. Um, I'd like it to be deleted, please. Uh, that's a question. That's a fair question. I think for personal data, when we talk about um, the Data Protection Act, yes, you have a right to delete data in most circumstances. This may or may not be different. So how is it looking so far? Right. Um, Matthew Gould uh, is a former diplomat who now runs NHSX, which is, as I said, the IT wing of the um, NHS. Um, he's in charge of this project. And he put uh, a document up with Dr. Grant Lewis um, called Digital Contact Tracing, Protecting the NHS and Saving Lives. And um, he did a reasonably good job of selling the government's pr uh, proposed uh, centralised contact tracing application. Um, but there's some 
stuff in there. Like um, he's actually saying in future releases of the app, you can add more information than your basic stuff. And then they say, people, those of us who agree to provide this extra information will be playing a key role. And so the idea is here, there's an encouragement to give more than the basic amount of information, which um, I feel very, very um, dubious about. Uh, the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, went even further. Um, their COVID tracking app is in already in, um, in general release. And he actually went to uh, the whole of Australians and said, if you want the football back, you have to download the app. Uh, so be very careful about um, hard sell. You're doing your duty. It's also been used by the UK government to download an app. Um, you should only do something if you're comfortable um, with it rather than being blindsided into this. And um, when we get to the issue of data retention uh, in their document, Guild and Lewis actually said, you will always be able to delete the app and all associated data whenever you want. And then... Less than two weeks later, uh, Gould uh, was giving testimony to the Parliament's Human Rights Committee, and he basically said, well, actually, no, as soon as you upload the data, we keep it forever. So you control your data right up to the point where it's useful, uh, is what the government is saying. And again, that's not, what, that's not a good uh, ethical uh, uh, behaviour, in my opinion. And this is my opinion, your yeah, opinions do vary, um, that you should be in control of your personal data at all times, not just um, when it's convenient. Now, I mentioned Australia, and it's kind of doing it better. And it really pains me to say that, that Australia is doing something better than we are. They rolled out their app called COVID Safe um, a little over a week ago. And it's already been downloaded 5.5 uh, million times um, uh, inside Australia. Now, the app is terrible. Uh, it, it is hard to describe how bad the app is. There is an entire Twitter thread um, of security professionals tearing this app to pieces. Um, the user interface is very confusing. You have to sign up to all sorts of um, agreements, uh, absolved in the Australian government, pretty much everything. Um, the software is possibly illegal in that it took code from Singapore and didn't credit it. Um, it doesn't work properly on iOS because it is a centralized app and it has to this problem with Bluetooth. Um, and it's doing things the more seriously, such as it interferes with Bluetooth connections used by glu blood glucose monitors for diabetic patients, which means their glucose monitors actually stop working. And um, there's even a way of turning their app into malicious software. And it's uh, the instructions on how to do that are actually in the Google Play Store reviews of the um, COVID safe app uh, in Australia. So you don't even have to be a skilled hacker to turn it into a piece of malware. However, and again, this pains me to say it, the Australian government has actually done something right. Um, They've put it in a legal framework. So it is a centralized application, but the data is held on servers inside Australia, which means it's governed by largely Australian law. And by law, none of the data obtained by COVID Safe can be shared with any other organization, whether that's a university, a pharmaceutical company, or anything. Or any part of government outside those immediately dealing with the pandemic. That means it cannot be used by the um, social security organization. It cannot be used by immigration. And the reason for that is to try and make people who are vulnerable and on the margins of society, and where Australia has a pretty poor record of treating those people, getting them to use the app and hopefully be safer. The other thing the Australian government has said, it is not compulsory. You will not be denied benefit if you do not use the app. You will not be denied access to transport. You will not be denied access to schools if you do not download this app. And again, this is being put into law. Any user of COVID safe can request all of their data is deleted at any time. So if you downloaded the app and you shared some of your personal data with the central server, 
you can fill out a, simp a simple form on the Australian government website and the data will be deleted within, I think it's two weeks. And after the pandemic, the Australian government has said they will be telling users you can now delete the app. And at the same time, all of the centrally stored data will be deleted and the backups destroyed. This project has an end date. That, none of this so far has been proposed by the UK government. What I'd like to point out now is contact tracing apps are kind of sexy. They're getting a lot of attention, but they can't fix this problem we're in at the moment. And a contact tracing app only really makes sense if the technology works and people use it. And here's the part that the UK is really been falling over. You can then get access to reliable tests, and those tests can be processed quickly. It is no point people self-reporting that they feel ill if they can't find out whether they're ill or not. Let's also remember that contact tracing apps are useless to those people who don't have access to technology or are unable to use it. We mustn't turn ourselves into a society where the people who are relatively rich, well-educated and able to use technology have advantages where those who are less fortunate cannot do it. And this applies to contact tracing apps and also this idea of possible digital immunity certificates, which is another piece of technology that's getting a lot of hype now. Once this is over and you've been tested and found to be immune to COVID, will you be able to have a small app on your phone which says, I'm OK, I can fly, I can go on a train, I can go into restaurants? What do you do about the people who do not have those sort of protections? And these naturally raise questions about the role of technology in society, not just the ones about citizens, but as I mentioned earlier, Google and Apple are telling national governments what they can and cannot do. No one voted for Google, no one voted for Apple, but they can actually now say to a government, actually, we're not going to let you do something that you think might be a benefit to our citizens. Perhaps you think Apple and Google are right in this case, but they may not always be. Uh, and so this means we as technology users, people, those of us in education, we've got to have a conversation about this. We've got to talk to people who use the technology, people who develop technology, and governments. Um, but that requires someone to listen, and I'm always dubious that anyone is listening, and it's quite entirely possible that actually no one is listening anymore to this presentation. Anyway, that's all I've got. As I said, it's a very superficial. Um, let's try and explain what's going on, hopefully, demystified a little bits of it. Uh, if there are any more questions, we can try and answer those later. So what I'm going to do now is um, we've got question and answers coming along. Um, so please post your questions either into the chat window of Microsoft Teams or by emailing stem-news at open.ac.uk. However, in the meantime, um, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Chitra and Ray. Um, Chitra, would you very briefly like to introduce yourself and if uh, any comments you have about contact tracing in general? Sure, Mike. Uh, can people hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Thank you, Mike. A uh, very, very interesting uh, talk. Um, Yes, I'm Chitra Balakrishna. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Computing and Communications, uh, and I'm also leading the, the cybersecurity program within the school. Uh, to give a brief, sort of very brief background to uh, what I do, my uh, interests coming from the communications and networking background, uh, I've always worked with technologies uh, that enabled connecting, connecting machine to machine, machine to pay people, machine to places, objects, uh, etc. But in the last few years, seven to eight years now, I've focused on the consequences of the, 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 the these you know, uh, technologies that enable connectivity. While they have enabled a lot of innovation, unimaginable sort of uh, types of services, but it comes with a price consequence of uh, security, particularly, particularly ethical and privacy uh, related consequences. Uh, my interest particularly lies in understanding the humans in this loop, uh, you know, social technological applications, uh, their security behavior, why humans 
uh, different people perceive security and risk differently and how that impacts uh, various you know, services that, they, that are enabled by these uh, emerging technologies. That's where my specific interest lies. Now, with respect to contact tracing, just like most of you uh, uh, working within the technology and outside, I've been doing my own reading, understanding, uh, you know, what various countries are trying to do in terms of of contact tracing. For me, at the crux, basically, uh, is to, uh, you know, is for technologists, uh, medical professionals, you know, other scientists, uh, uh, even security professionals to come together to creating an app that could be a useful and effective supplement to manual tracing, you know, whatever it takes. So the human in me, <laughs> when reading all the the, the, the the scale of this pandemic and the damages, the, social, the health uh, damages to the health, socio-economic damages that it's caused, human in me says, do whatever it takes to create that supplement to manual tracing. That's not effective. That could be, uh, you know, will not take us anywhere. But the uh, the technologies in me, you know, does raise certain questions. I think it's too early days to sort of share expert opinions on, you know, the the uh, the do's and the don'ts, or you know, uh, or the, the success or the failure of uh, various uh, solutions. It, I think it's too early for that. But what we could do, which Mike has very successfully done, uh, you know, a lot of things uh, that I wanted to share. Is I think Mike has addressed all the various basis actually in in terms of highlighting various concerns and uh, issues so in terms of the first concern that i had when i was you know reading about these apps is of course the success of this app entirely depends on you know how many people will download and use it and how widely should it be uh, used in order for it to be successful uh, in, in in its task uh, mike did mention in his talk that at least 60% of uh, you know the population needs to use it to be, uh, you know, to see some form of uh, success in, in contact tracing. But beyond that, uh, I think the key questions that Mike has already addressed, I'm only going to repeat it, is, you know, the kind of data that uh, these apps are uh, going to collect and uh, who is it going to be shared with? And uh, more importantly, how will this information be used in the future? Uh, you know, and are there any policies put in place already or, uh, are, are there any you know, uh, promises of those policies to be put in place to prevent any abuse of the data collected? So uh, one of the article, I can't remember if it was in Medium or MIT Review, uh, there is an article that sort of reviews the various contact tracing apps across the globe, across various countries, where they compare those apps across four different metrics, you know, apps that are voluntary, that is the, the users voluntarily has to download the app, use the app and share the, the, uh, the data in terms of reporting the, the um, uh, symptoms, et cetera. And the, limit, the amount of data collected, clarity on what data is collected uh, from, the, from the users who have the app downloaded. And also clarity on uh, is the data being destroyed? Uh, I know uh, I'm, I'm closely following uh, the development within the UK, while also I'm also uh, following the development in uh, India and Malaysia and the, some of the Asian countries. I know some of the governments have, you know, declared that the data would be destroyed within the the uh, you know the, the infection life cycle within 28 days of uh, gathering that data. But the UK government has shared no such information in terms of data destruction and data retention. That's we need more clarity on that, and more clarity on the the whole transparency of the data journey from the time it's gathered to uh, the, the the risk analysis uh, and uh, you know uh, the timeline um, of of the data journey itself. And more transparency on that is needed. And and, and I, th I think UK has not the government has not released any uh, you know information on that. So that's that's my take. But to sort of uh, conclude, uh, uh, taking on on the technological, uh, you know, disadvantages of Bluetooth and the way the UK contact tracing app is designed to function, uh, UK government having not, not bowed down to Apple and Google's API that uh, permits its use only in de decentralized apps. I feel the success of the UK tracing app is sort of in question, given that. You know, how can an app that only works when most citizens, at least 60% of the citizen or the population within the country has the app downloaded, open, 
and running in the foreground at all times uh, to be effective. So uh, until we answer some of these you know, uh, questions in terms of how we can uh, enable Bluetooth sharing of information, how to uh, you know, circumvent some of these issues, I'm not entirely optimistic about the success of this contact tracing app. Uh, apart from the other security-related concerns I have. Thanks, Shikha. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I turn to Ray, um, if it's okay. Uh, Ray, would you, um, uh, first of all, give us your general thought on contact tracing? And we've got a couple of questions in the sidebar about whether GDPR and data protection regulations will um, cover this app. <laughs> That's a big question. Uh, I mean, thanks, first of all, Mike, for uh, a really uh, useful and engaging overview of, of the issues around this. Um, I've got a, a thousand things I could say about each one of the things you've, you've mentioned, but primarily I think we need to think about um, the context we're living in. We have a, a serious crisis, the pandemic, which policymakers are looking for ways out of. Uh, and at the moment, grasping at a, an app is is one of the things that's happening. Um, the to, to some extent, this is this is what Ross Anderson at Cambridge calls "do something itis." And if you got an app for that, great. But actually, an app is not going to get you out of of the pandemic. Uh, it could if it works. And this is, I mean, you talk about privacy. You talked about false positives, false negatives, some of the issues around it. Um, it could, if it works, form very small part of the response to the pandemic, but only a very small part. An app and the data it generates is utterly useless unless we have a robust, universal and rapid testing regime. And at the moment, we actually don't have that um, in the UK sufficient to make uh, appropriate use of even a successful app. So. First thing we have to, 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 to get in place is, is the testing um, regime. Then we have to know, find out if, as Tritra says, does the thing work? And you've, you've uh, outlined a whole, whole host of, of issues that have to be come together so that it does work. Um, and the last thing then, um, well, no, not the last thing, uh, the, the last structural thing is trust. Um, if people don't trust it, um, they're not going to use it. And there's all kinds of reasons why it won't work. Uh, you've specified yourself. Uh, I mean, somebody who is using the app uh, and doing their their patriotic duty to download it and use it. By the, the third or fourth time that they've gone into um, false positive lockdown, they're going to get pretty fed up with it, uh, as you've described yourself. Uh, and the other aspect that, that Chitra outlined in detail is the issue of tracking the data and the privacy issues around it. Uh, to some degree, I'm relaxed about that. I mean, I've been campaigning on privacy issues and working with policymakers in this area from UK Parliament to European Commission to the UN for, for 25 years. But I'm, I'm kind of relaxed about the privacy issues in the context of the limited time of the pandemic. What I'm more concerned about in relation to the data is the things that you alluded to in the ways that it could be used to discriminate against people. And on the issue of the legal side of this, partly of which the, the Aussies have been working on, as, as you described, I'm not sure the legislation has been passed yet, but it's been, it's been unusually enlightened um, for the current Australian government. Um, part of the issue around this is you have to get the legal frameworks in place before you deploy systems like this. So the... Um, you have to be proactive about it uh, and you have to impose safeguards against coercion of the type that you were describing, against discrimination against uh, poorer communities and black and ethnic minority communities who are disproportionately affected, as we've discovered from the statistics from the, uh, from the Office for National Statistics in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and we have to be proactive about protecting those communities who can and historically have been harmed by the collection and exploitation of data. Um, and we have to put legal protections and legal structures in place to expressly prohibit the economic and social discrimination um, uh, against uh, those kind of communities. I mean, there's academics in the UK, for example, led by Professor Lillian Edwards at Newcastle University, uh, have proposed model legislation to prevent that kind of compulsory coercion. Um, 
uh, uh, along the lines that you're talking about using public transport, going into to cafes, getting back to work and all that sort of stuff. So uh, in terms of the GDPR, the GDPR and data protection law actually provides for pandemic situations, specifically describes, includes, includes pandemics within the provisions of the law uh, uh, in relation to the questions you're discussing. And there are provisions that enables emergency circumstances uh, data to be used in, in this kind of context. Um, I could go on, but should probably stop there and enable uh, and uh, let people to, to get some questions in. Thank you again, uh, Ray. Um, right, I'm just going to go back through. Uh, GDPR has come up several times. Um, ben asked uh, what legal frameworks are the government proposing? Um, they're not proposing any at the moment. Um, that is the reason the Human Rights Committee published their report at the end of last week. Uh, we are they're, they're, the government's actually being very, very furtive about the legal framework uh, in which this app is sitting. Um, Shaley uh, sent a very interesting link to, uh, about Professor Michael Parker, um, who is director of the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities, and he was interviewed last week on Sky and said that only a small amount of time, uh, data, for, oh, sorry, uh, information will only be held for a small amount of time, and people should realise the information is being shared for the wider good. Um, yes, there is 28 an argument days, for, the current, the current um, uh, on, setup on the UK app is 28 days retention. Yes, that's the data retention on the app, but as I, as I pointed out, once it's uploaded to the NHS then servers, lost the it. government is... The government is proposing to retain the data indefinitely, so I That's think right. Professor Parker was misspeaking there. Uh, yeah. Once, the, yeah, once the data is uploaded, currently the proposal is the NHS will be able to share it and use it as they see fit for quote research purposes. Um, oh, question from Arosha. To address the digital divide, we'll be better off producing a single purpose, cheaper contact tracing device, such as a dosimeter based on a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, that's a nice idea, uh, but I'm not sure whether I should ever get back into the proposal of designing another piece of hardware that we ship out to millions of people again, Arosha. That got me into a lot of trouble last time. Um, Sharon says, how much space is likely to be needed to install and run either type of app? They're not going to be terribly big applications, Sharon. The functionality is actually quite small. They're actually mostly built on standard parts of the operating system. And the pseudonyms, the blobs, and thank you for, I missed that, uh, who uh, pointed out the blob stands for, um, well, I should know what blob stands for um, earlier. The, the blobs are actually very small. So um, they're actually going to be a standard size application, probably smaller than most games. I've not heard any problems about space being the issue for using the apps. Um, where do we find a, uh, Anna asks, where do we find reactions on this platform? I'm oh, no, sorry, that's a question for um, Ben, I apologize. Uh, Eleanor asks, if the uptake in Singapore is only 20%, is there any likelihood that with such a lack of trust on the government there'll be the required uptake in the UK? Um, some numbers came out uh, earlier this week that a sizable proportion of the population of the Isle of Wight had signed up for the application. Um, it's below 60%, certainly. Um, I would expect when this application comes out, um, that there will be a major push by government to install it, probably including television, advertising, and almost certainly shrieking in the media that you must do your patriotic duty. Now, to point out, if it becomes a decentralised app, many of my concerns about the amount of data vanish because the data isn't held by the NHS or the government, and the value of the material that could be resold uh, is much diminished over a centralised app. I would still much prefer it to be released inside a proper legal framework where the application N dies of its own accord or Apple turn off or Apple and Google turn off the servers. And and I would be decentralized, much sorry to interrupt, Mike. Structurally sorry, no, go ahead. The decentralised architecture is straight, more straightforward to shut down when the thing is over. Yes. And I think I think at least one point Apple and Google were actually saying they would shut the, the servers down. 
Yeah. Uh, but I would like it to be in a legal framework. It, it, the, le the legality of this. And I do want to see um, some um, moves by government to actually say how people who don't have access to the technology, who are generally the most vulnerable parts of the population, are expected to um, have some of the benefits and rights that those people who install the app would actually intend have. And that's key because uh, otherwise Liam, it just becomes an electronic tag for discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Um, Francis has met, oh, Francis uh, has got a good point here. Some work situations will make the app useless. For example, in a courtroom, most people will have their phone turned off or locked in a cupboard, and not be able to carry a phone. But most courtrooms are unable to operate effectively with social distancing and forces. They are too small and require eye contact. Yeah, that's a good point there, uh, Francis. Yeah, thank you for that one. Um, right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Good one. Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, Robert points out many children of secondary school age and above have phones, but are unable, are not allowed to have them switched on within the school environment. Also true. And of course, their school environments are, it's hard to maintain social distancing amongst children. Um, Ooh, Chitra's got a point now. I'll go. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you for pushing this one. What are your thoughts on making the use of the app mandatory to people at high risk, key workers to start with? Ooh. Um, no, very, right, right. Okay. We're now, okay, that's now, Blaine has said, key workers are amongst the most poorly paid, uh, such as cleaners, and go against these principles. Um, wow. Uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, no, my inner, no. No, absolutely, you cannot make this app mandatory to people at high risk. You have to find um, better ways of doing that, such as testing them and actually getting them the test results at uh, a rapid rate. I mean, at the moment, many people in the UK are not getting test results for 10 days, and uh, whereas there are no tests available that can give you within 24 hours. So no chitra, we should not make the app mandatory uh, to people, even those at high risk. We should just make sure they are tested and protected from the virus in general. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our session. Uh, if you've got any further questions and you would like uh, myself, Ray, or Chitra to answer them, uh, please mail them to Katrina at the STEM uh, email address. Thank you very much for tuning in this afternoon. Uh, it's now time for me to have lunch just before my um, next meeting. Uh, please stay safe and we'll talk again soon.